Thanks, Danielle, for the introduction and thanks for everyone uh, showing up today this uh, afternoon on the East Coast. Um, so yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, various types of volcanoes and how we can understand them with uh, seismic imaging. So why do we care about multi-scale volcanic arc structure? And just to motivate this, we're going to start with, you know, a basic cartoon about what an arc volcano looks like. So we have our subducting oceanic lithosphere coming in from the right on this diagram, and then from uh, dehydration of material or uh, material flux uh, through the asthenosphere that then produces um, the magmatic front that leads to the volcanic arc at subduction zones. So when we're thinking about the processes that uh, regulate and form these types of features, we can think about on the first scale, the lithosphere, the subducting oceanic lithosphere, and we can ask questions about what is the temperature of that oceanic lithosphere? What is the age of the plate prior to subduction? How much uh, is hydration is there? What is uh, contained within the plate in the way of volatiles? How much downgoing subducting sediment is there? What depth uh, is the dehydration occurring at? But we can also think about a crustal scale problem. Uh, so when we actually have the volcanic arc forming, uh, we think about where is the magma transport happening and over what time scales is that happening as magma moves from the mantle, uh, past the moho and through the crust eventually to eruption. And when we think about that, we can think about variables such as the overriding crustal composition, the thickness of that overriding crust, the stress state, and then of course the input magma composition, which ties it back to those lithospheric scale variables. So we do have inherently embedded in our understanding of arcs, a very multi-scale process. And so why do, does this matter? Why do we actually care about learning about uh, volcanic arc structure. And I think the best way to motivate this is through some key questions that were recently highlighted in the erupt uh, National Academy of Sciences report um, for uh, motivation for general outlook on volcano science. Um, and three, three questions are what causes ascending magma to stall at different levels in the crust and what determines the fraction that eventually erupts through what processes are eruptible bodies of magma assembled, and for how long do they persist, and how and how quickly do magma bodies mobilize before erupting? And to answer these questions, we need to understand things like what is the variable inputs to the system in terms of magma composition, and what sort of things might affect where these things uh, stall as they travel through the overriding crust. So how do I answer these questions? And hopefully this is a cartoon that some of you are familiar with and can relate to, um, but it's from XKCD. I live next to a wall of rock 20 miles thick. There's no way around or over it. I'm trapped on the side forever. I study the stuff on the other side. So it's a description of mantle geology and really any sort of uh, folk or science that focuses on the uh, uh, deeper part of the earth can probably relate to the sentiments here. Um, since this is an IRIS webinar, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with seismology, but just in case there's anyone in the uh, room uh, that is not as familiar, we basically can use seismic waves to see inside the earth. And this is just a, uh, a movie uh, produced with Axisum showing a wave propagation through the earth and how we have uh, different um, speeds of wave propagation relative, related to whether or not there are colder subducting slabs, for example, that have faster seismic velocities on the left, or warmer mantle plumes that have uh, uh, slower seismic velocities on the right. And as I'm sure, again, you all know, just like you know, we think about physics and we have different types of motion for different properties of springs. We have different properties of seismic waves uh, for different types of rock. And so we can use the properties of seismic waves to learn something about the inside of the earth. So what are we actually trying to learn using multi-scale seismic imaging of arc volcanoes? And I'm gonna motivate the rest of my talk with two overarching research questions uh, that I'm going to attempt to at least start to answer in the next hour or so, um, or in the next 40 minutes. Uh, so the first question is, 
what is the crustal magmatic architecture beneath individual volcanoes from surface to moho? And we know that there is variability on a global scale. So the diagram on the left is showing the depths to shallowest magma storage estimated at uh, various volcanoes across uh, volcanic arcs globally. The color indicates the depth and the different symbols indicate whether or not uh, those estimates come from geodesy, geophysics, or petrology. Uh, and so you can see that there is quite a bit of variability um, from you know, 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 kilometers in terms of where magma is stored underneath uh, these volcanoes, uh, both you know, across different arcs in the world and even you know, between different volcanoes within the same arc. And on the right, we're looking more in depth at not just the shallowest magma storage, but a range of depths of magma storage uh, in a transect in the Aleutian Island arc. Um, this is now showing estimates uh, underneath uh, six different Aleutian Island volcanoes constrained by uh, seismicity, GPS INSAR measurements, and melt inclusions. And you can see that there can be quite a range of depth estimates for magma storage. There can be different levels. Um, the fact that the estimates from these different techniques are not necessarily the same doesn't necessarily indicate that uh, the techniques are wrong, it just reflects different sensitivities of these different techniques. Um, and so to really start to understand this full system that is quite complex, we are, when we're using different techniques, we are seeing that we can have these, you know, multiple different levels of magma storage and it is quite complicated system. And, you know, perhaps the best uh, motivator of this are results that are coming out of the recent IMUSH experiment at Mount St. Helens. On the left, we have an example of a profile from active source seismic imaging, um, which is detailing some of the seismic velocities under Mount St. Helens. The slow velocities have been interpreted as uh, areas of some sort of uh, magmatic uh, features. And so we see that there is this um, very complicated structure. Uh, it has, you know, 3D structure to it. It's not just some simple basic uh, 2D uh, structure. Um, and there's multiple different levels of it, again. Um, on the right, with the resistivity, this is now looking a little bit more broadly um, at not just uh, zoomed into Mount St. Helens. We're seeing also Mount Rainier and Mount Adams. And there's this uh, low um, uh, conductivity area that's, again, been interpreted as areas of some degree of um, uh, magmatic uh, associated material. And you can see that there's the deflection around um, a pluton and there is a deflection from a lower crustal storage area from uh, Mount St. Helens. And so this is a very, very complicated system. So, you know, IMOSH is one of these uh, high density geophysical experiments where we actually have very high resolution images at volcanoes and where we do have this capability, we are seeing, starting to see evidence of very, very complex structure. However, um, the second research question is then going to turn to uh, what is the variability in the source of the volcanic systems and how does that influence their structure and behavior? And when we're talking about volcanic arc systems, the source of that volcanism has to do with the incoming oceanic lithosphere in terms of the uh, dehydration and mass flux that might be associated um, with the downgoing slab producing those volcanic arcs. And on this broadest scale, we do see associations between heterogeneous features on the incoming oceanic lithosphere and changes in volcanic arc behavior. So on the left, we have an example from South America where, where we have these incoming ridges on the oceanic lithosphere that are associated with pl flat slab subduction and an absence of arc volcanism. Uh, and if we want to think about what the structure, seismic structure, seismic velocity structure of the oceans are, in many places we are still really restricted to using these global scale tomography images. And this is an example um, from a recent paper in 2018 of an updated uh, Pacific global tomography image. Um, however, when we think about finer scale arc structure, we start to run into some problems uh, with tying this source to a uh, source variability to arc variability. 
here's an example in Cascadia where we know there is a long arc uh, variability. In the Southern Cascades, we have a higher quaternary eruptive volume than the North Cascades. But if we wanted to go and look at some of the lithospheric scale features of the uh, incoming Juan de Fuca oceanic plate, uh, and using this type of global scale seismic imaging, it, we really don't have the level of resolution that we need in order to see if there's any sort of uh, plate scale variability uh, that uh, might be long term related to this sort of variability. So this is a difficult question to ask with um, just uh, traditional methods for imaging the uh, global scale seismic imaging methods in the oceans. Okay. So how are we actually getting past these challenges and addressing these two questions? Uh, and so it's using seismic imaging. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to investigate two systems. And the first system is going to be looking at two individual volcanoes in the Aleutian Island arc. And that's going to be focused on answering the first research question that I've outlined. And for the second half of the talk, I'm going to be looking instead at the entire Cascadia subduction system. And that's going to be focused on answering the second research question for this talk. And in doing this, we're talking about two different seismic techniques and two different scales. So in the first half of the talk, when we're examining uh, detailed crustal structure underneath these two volcanoes, we're going to be using receiver function techniques. Um, and we're going to be really focused on just the individual volcano scale. You can see the scale bar for a zero to 10 uh, kilometers in the lower uh, right hand corners of those two maps. Whereas for the second part of the talk, again, we're thinking more about these broader scale lithospheric structures and we're going to be using surface wave imaging across the Cascadia subduction zone. And you can see the difference in scale in that scale bar there. And I'll introduce the techniques as I get to them in, uh, during the talk. Okay. So let's first focus on these two individual volcanoes in the Aleutian Island Arc, Cleveland Volcano and Akatan Volcano. So going back to the first research question about what is crustal uh, magmatic architecture from MOHO um, to edifice essentially, why has this been a difficult question to answer? What have been some of the challenges um, for answering this, this first research question? And I already introduced IMUSH as you know one of the current type examples of uh, really high quality, high resolution images coming out for an individual volcano. However, IMUSH, you know, is an expensive project. It's time consuming. It's a large N seismic deployment. So it involved, for example, 70 broadband seismometers. That requires a lot of uh, resources. And even with all of that, a lot of traditional seismic tomography techniques still have inherent resolution limitations, particularly for imaging the deeper part of the system, the deeper crustal part of the system. However, I'm going to try to convince you today that we can use receiver function techniques to get at least a basic image of deep crustal magmatic structure with only a few broadband instruments akin to a, a monitoring network on a volcano. We don't need a high density deployment. And so we're going to start with Akatan volcano and I'm going to be showing you results that used only three broadband seismometers deployed on that island. Okay, so again, since this is an IRIS webinar, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with uh, these seismic techniques, but just very briefly, uh, so receiver functions, the key thing to remember here is that they are sensitive to abrupt seismic velocity boundaries. So I have a seismic station deployed somewhere in the world, it's recording teleseismic earthquakes, and if there is an abrupt uh, seismic velocity boundary underneath that seismometer, as a P wave comes up uh, to the seismometer and is recorded, when it hits that abrupt velocity boundary, part of that energy is going to convert to an S wave. Um, and so something about the difference in the arrival time between the P and that PS conversion is going to tell you about the thickness of that layer and the velocity with seismic velocity within that layer. And, you know, you've probably heard about receiver functions to image things like the MOHO, the lithosphere, stenosphere boundary, the transition zone. Typically, these global features that ha are associated with abrupt seismic velocity boundaries are usually the targets of receiver function studies. Um, another key thing to remember is just that there is going to be a trade-off between velocity and thickness of 
the layer when we're looking at the measured lag time, we can either describe that with changes in velocity or changes in thickness. Um, but in general, receiver functions tell you something about uh, abrupt boundaries beneath your seismometer. And so typically when people use receiver functions, they will record teleseismic earthquakes from all over the globe and calculate a receiver function for each individual earthquake and then add them all together to calculate what's called a station stack. So I'm showing you an example of a station stack for this uh, station at Akatan, AKRB. And this has been calculated for all of the earthquakes uh, indicated by the global map on the right. And so then this is the final uh, receiver function that will be calculated for that station on the uh, left. Now embedded in this, when you do this, is an assumption that you have relatively homogeneous crust laterally underneath the station. So these ray paths aren't coming up directly vertically under the station. There is some horizontal uh, distance away from the station. And so this is, for example, a 35 kilometer moho. All those black dots on the map are the places where the ray path would be predicted to intersect the moho. And so essentially when you're adding all of these receiver functions together, you are assuming that the crust in that you know, rough radius circle is basically homogeneous and uh, all of the receiver functions are sampling the same crust. And you should start to see why this could be a big problem when you're using stations that are in the vicinity of a volcano. And if you go and you actually look at the individual receiver functions in detail at this particular station, you start to see directional variability. So uh, hopefully you can all see this, um, but the, these are now all the individual receiver functions for all the individual teleseismic events. And the ones highlighted uh, in the green, have the green bar on top of them, those are events from uh, South Central America earthquakes. And the ones on the right are Western Pacific and Asia earthquakes. And you should very clearly be able to see that the first five seconds of the receiver function character looks very different between them. And again, if we turn back to our map view of this, you'll see that for the South Central America events, these are all from uh, ray paths that would have passed under the main volcanic edifice at Akatan, whereas the other events are from ray paths that would not have passed under that main volcanic edifice. And so we're clearly seeing some evidence of crustal structure associated with the MOHO at the station. So we can then use that to answer our first research question, what is the crustal magmatic architecture beneath volcanoes? So we did this uh, back in 2013 at three individual stations uh, surrounding the Akatan volcano. And uh, the blue receiver functions on the left are stacked receiver functions for the directions uh, shown in blue on the map on your right and in orange are uh, for stacks receiver functions for the opposite direction. So blue are for ray paths that point back towards the main volcanic edifice, orange is away. And you see that there's an extra arrival at about two seconds in the receiver functions uh, for ray paths that have passed under the main volcanic edifice. We did a series of forward modeling tests and we were able to most easily explain this feature in the receiver functions as some mid-crustal low velocity zone ranging from about seven to 11 kilometers of depth. Um, and because we observed it at all three stations, it has to be fairly widespread under the entire island, including a farther uh, extent to the east than to the west. If we compare this to uh, other uh, um, indicators of volcanic activity at Akatan, in particular seismicity, uh, we can see that this fits in well um, with the idea that this low velocity zone is indicating some sort of a magmatic chamber or a partial melt region, um, and that the seismicity, the shallow seismicity is largely occurring a shallower than this depth, so that relates to this uh, seismicity being a source, uh, being due to inflation and deflation. Um, and we also see that laterally, um, it also fits in well with where uh, the seismicity is occurring, in particular that farther um, eastern extent uh, is uh, coincident with an eastern patch of uh, shallow seismicity as well. <clears throat> 
So you have this really nice overlap between what we were seeing in the receiver function data um, for a evidence for a mid-crustal uh, magma uh, body, as well as um, uh, other types of, uh, it, it, it's consistent with the seismicity um, underneath the island. So now we're going to turn to Cleveland Volcano, and this is another volcano. It's about 300 kilometers west in the Aleutian Island Arc, and we can ask the same questions. Do we see a low-velocity zone underneath Cleveland, and does it have the same relationship to seismicity as Akatan? So again, I'm showing you individual receiver functions uh, for one of the stations on the islands, now CLES. Hopefully, again, you can see that there is a shift in uh, the character of these receiver functions. Um, and again, this is a uh, back as measles shift as I've outlined on the uh, map on the left. So we see again a similar pattern of local variation in the receiver function data consistent with the same type of uh, relationship uh, with the uh, volcano that we saw at Akatan. Um, but what sort of structures are we actually imaging here? And our approach here uh, is a little bit different than Akatan Volcano. But what we did was we took, excuse me, we took the variation in the arrival time that is seen in that arrival that has been highlighted at these individual stations, and we tried to either explain it entirely as a function of variations in uh, MOHO depths or entirely as a variations in uh, crustal velocity, because we're pretty sure this is still just the PS conversion from the MOHO. So if we want to explain it just entirely as variations in MOHO depths, uh, this is now again just showing you for that one single station, the colored dots are showing you the location of the predicted MOHO pierce points for the ray paths, and the colors indicate the estimated depths. Um, and, you know, it's consistent with shallower moho in the uh, east and a deeper moho in the west. Alternatively, we could uh, explain it entirely as variations in crustal velocity. Again, this is for this one station. I'm showing you the ray paths, uh, predicted ray paths, and uh, the colors are indicating um, the uh, crustal shear velocity that would be needed to explain that change in travel time that we're seeing in the receiver functions. Now, both of these for an individual station actually fit the data pretty reasonably well. However, if we do this for all of the stations on the island, explaining it entirely due to variations in MOHO depth requires about 20 kilometers of MOHO topography over about five kilometers spatially. Uh, whereas explaining it with variations in crustal shear velocity requires about a one kilometer per second change in the average shear velocity in the crust. So our preferred interpretation is that at least the bulk of our observations that we're seeing in the receiver function data are due to changes in uh, crustal shear velocity as opposed to MOHO topography. There may be some uh, contribution from MOHO topography as well, but we don't think that's the major source of this. So this is similar now to uh, the relationship we had seen with Akatan. We're seeing low velocities under the volcano. But what is the relationship with seismicity in the, underneath Cleveland? And we're still in the process of determining uh, an actual better constrained, uh, a, depth, a, a higher resolution depth constraint of where these low velocities actually are originating from in the crust. However, what we can definitely say is that unlike at Akatan, the receiver function data does not support it being a mid-crustal, thin, sill-like structure that would be clearly associated with seismicity. Uh, if we put that sort of velocity model in, it does not match our receiver functions at all. Um, and so what could explain our observations is either a more uh, a slow velocity region that's either more widespread in depth throughout the crust or a velocity gradient type structure. And we're still in the process of really seeing how much resolution we have here um, and how well we can constrain this. But it is definitely a different crustal architecture than what was seen at Akatan, um, which implies that it probably has a somewhat different relationship to seismicity and is probably likely more widespread throughout the crust. Okay, so 
we have evidence that the crustal magmatic architecture beneath these two volcanoes is quite different. Um, and we can then ask why. Why do the two volcanoes that are part of the same arc have different magmatic architecture? They're only about 300 kilometers away. And we can look at, say, crustal thickness, uh, but as, at least as far as we know in the Aleutian Island arc, crustal thickness actually looks relatively consistent. Uh, similarly, it transects um, through the Aleutians uh, where that passes both Cleveland and Akatan volcano, doesn't see any major differences in um, uh, crustal uh, seismic uh, velocity, crustal P wave seismic velocity from an active source study. So at least as far as we know at the resolution that we have, we don't really see any major differences observed in the overriding plate between these two volcanoes. What is interesting is that actually one of the features that really jumps out as being very different between these two volcanoes is the depths of the slab. And this is work that's being done with uh, Dan Rasmussen imaging, uh, excuse me, investigating uh, the um, uh, petrology of the volcanoes in this entire transect in the Aleutian Islands. Um, but Cleveland volcano is estimated to only have a slab depth of about 70 kilometers beneath it, whereas Akatan is more closer to 85, 90 uh, kilometers depth. Um, and so this is the feature that really does kind of jump out as being very different between these two volcanoes. And then if we're going to make that observation, we then have to ask the question, well, why? What would be causing the variation in the slab depths underneath these two volcanoes? What is causing uh, dehydration processes to be occurring differently, such or mantle flow, or something is going on that's different at a much deeper depth underneath these two volcanoes than related to the overriding crust? And if we want to answer that question, we want to ask, well, what do we know about the subduction input to the system? And this leads us back to the problem that I introduced at the beginning with our understanding of what seismic uh, velocity structure of the oceanic lithospheres are if all, we're, if all the data that we have is restricted to a, um, a global seismic uh, velocity tomography. And so in this section of the Aleutians and the central Aleutians, we really don't know that much about the uh, seismic, um, uh, the velocities of the oceanic, incoming oceanic lithosphere here. You know, it's part of the two volcanoes are basically part of the same pixel. So we don't really have any way of seeing if there's any sort of, you know, significant variation. However, if we turn to Cascadia, this is one of the places where we actually do have comparable offshore and onshore lithospheric scale resolution for an oceanic plate uh, in a subduction zone. And so we can use this as an analog to at least guide our understanding of how much we should be concerned about uh, oceanic uh, structure as a significant contributor to subduction uh, variability. So, Again, motivating the second part of the talk, why have, uh, why, why, what have the challenges been to understanding the inputs of volcanic arc systems? What have the challenges been to understanding what the seismic uh, properties um, of uh, oceanic lithosphere? And in subduction zones, of course, this is uh, obviously an amphibious system. So we have uh, an onshore part, or maybe even a minimal onshore part, if it's an island arc, uh, and an oceanic arc, uh, and an oceanic portion. And in Cascadia, you know, the onshore portion of the subduction zone for a long time has been well uh, monitored, has been well, um, has, has had high resolution seismic deployments due to earth scope and various local arrays. And in Cascadia, it's one of the few places that at this you know, regional seismic imaging target scale, we actually also have a similar uh, array density offshore as we do onshore, thanks to the Cascadia Initiative uh, experiment. And so the Cascadia Initiative experiment, if any of you aren't familiar about it, uh, was an initiative, it was a community experiment um, that began uh, deployment in 2011. It was led by Doug Toomey, as well as many others were involved with it. Um, and it led and it deployed these uh, ocean bottom seismometers over the entire Juan de Fuca plate uh, over the course of four years. 
It also led to uh, construction of uh, new designs of ocean bottom seismometers, in particular these trawl resistant uh, designs, which enabled shelf deployment. Uh, all of the orange dots shown in the map on the right are OBSs that were um, uh, trawl resistant design. And so without having um, these newly designed instruments, which were funded by the American Recovery and Investment Act, um, we would not have had a consistent, uh, a consistent array continuous from the oceanic part through the accretionary uh, wedge forearc and then to onshore. So really, uh, this actually has allowed a seamless um, uh, seismic array going from offshore to onshore at the same uh, spatial uh, instrument um, deployment scale, which is important in terms of the resolution uh, that we can actually investigate the system at. So, for this part of the talk, we're turning to lithospheric scale imaging now instead of receiver functions. Um, and we're using uh, Rayleigh wave phase velocities to image along the entire subduction zone. If any of you aren't familiar with that, we're using surface wave. So again, we have a teleseismic earthquake that is recorded, but instead we're using the waves that are trapped along the uh, surface of the earth. Surface waves have a property called dispersion. And so basically uh, the depth in Inside the Earth that a particular uh, period of wave sees is related um, to that period. So, for example, 20-second uh, period waves, you know, have a shorter wavelength, so they see more shallowly inside the Earth, whereas a 60-second period wave has a longer wavelength and it sees deeper inside the Earth. And so you can see an example of this um, dispersion property in the figure, uh, the multicolor blue figure in the center here. And since seismic velocities tend to increase as we go deeper into the Earth, the 20 second wave packet, which only sees more shallowly, is arriving later than the longer period wave packets, which are sampling velocities that are deeper inside the Earth and on average faster. Um, so in general, I'm going to be showing you uh, phase velocity maps today. And uh, when you see short periods, you can think of them as being more indicative of relatively shallower structure, longer periods, relatively deeper structure. Um, but these periods do sample a range of depths, so we can't just uh, tag them to one specific depth range. It's not exactly equivalent to a, a depth slice in a traditional uh, shear velocity tomography images. Um, and so we're going to use this technique to investigate the uh, structure of the plate prior to subduction and along the volcanic arc in Cascadia. And just as a side note, I'm going to uh, present um, all of my results, the offshore and the onshore, seamlessly, and I'm not going to really talk anything about um, why uh, dealing with offshore data can be quite uh, challenging. However, just as a brief note, um, there are quite a few extra processing steps that need to go into using ocean bottom seismometer data uh, before you can use it seamlessly with traditional land-based seismology. Um, and so uh, whenever you're doing any one of these um, amphibious imaging uh, experiments, there are some extra steps that you have to go through. For example, um, one of the uh, main sources of noise in the oceans is something called compliance noise. And this is basically when you have your ocean bottom seismometer sitting on the seafloor, as the, as the water column essentially increases, the, the, the width of the water column increases and decreases as waves are moving above, um, that exerts a downward force on the seafloor. And so that actually causes your seismometer to move slightly up and down, um, and which induces a uh, signal on your vertical component. So that can be really problematic if you want to use your vertical components to actually go and learn something about the seismic waves that are being recorded. And so I'm showing you as an example, these two uh, ocean bottom seismometer stations, how strong and what frequencies are affected by this compliance noise is very dependent on water depth. Uh, the gray um, on the top of uh, in these two panels is the original seismic trace. Um, the black seismogram is the um, seismic trace that 
uh, we calculate after we apply standard uh, compliance corrections to the data. And this involves using um, a pressure uh, gauge that is deployed with the um, uh, seismometer to understand what exactly uh, the changes in the water column are and uh, use that to remove the water noise. And so you can see that after uh, we go through these steps, we get really, really nice seismograms on both types of uh, shallow water and deeper water seismic instruments. Um, but especially if you look at FNO7A with the original, you really had no way of being able to see if there was a signal in the data if you don't do these types of corrections. Um, and uh, we actually developed a uh, MATLAB package that is now available for anyone to use to uh, help um, automate the process of doing these corrections for future OBS experiments. Okay, so now we can turn to our second research question. How does variation in the source of these volcanic systems, so the variation in the structure of the incoming oceanic plate, influence their structure and behavior? And to start, we're just going to look at what the actual surface wave phase velocity maps are for Cascadia. So each one of these panels is, again, a different period, starting on the left with shorter periods, so generally uh, shallower sensitivity, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and on the right going to deeper sensitivities. The colors on each of these maps indicate uh, the phase velocity, so blues are faster phase velocities. That would be consistent with uh, colder temperatures, less melt, less fluid. Reds are slower seismic phase velocities, so that's consistent with hotter temperatures, more melt, more fluids. Um, and you can see from this that there, there are a lot of really interesting um, uh, features that we can very, very clearly see. For example, if you look at the 20-second panel, um, we very nicely see that there are somewhat slower velocities underneath the mid-ocean ridges that then get faster as we move away from the mid-ocean ridge, as the plate is getting older, it's getting colder, and then we see a strong dichotomy between uh, the oceanic uh, lithosphere and the continental lithosphere because at 20 seconds in the oceans we're probably primarily sampling mantle whereas in the continent at that point we're still probably peak sensitivity in the crust so we're getting slower seismic velocities on the continent we see a band of slow velocities associated with the volcanic arc um, so we really see a lot of nice details in these uh, seismic phase velocity maps just to belabor the point a little bit, you know, but showing to, again, motivate what this gets you. This is the same 40-second um, phase velocity uh, period uh, surface wave data being used to calculate these two maps. You can really see how much more detail we're able to see of what the oceanic lithosphere looks like when we actually are able to use local OBS uh, instruments that have been deployed on top of the structure that we're interested in imaging. Perhaps more surprisingly, though, actually, is also if we compare our results to previous onshore results. Um, so I'm comparing it to three uh, previous seismic um, uh, phase velocity maps, all at 25 seconds, um, all using surface wave uh, data, Rowley wave surface wave data. Um, and obviously, for the oceanic part of it, the, none of these have data. But interestingly, if you look at the four arcs, so from the volcanic arc to the west, um, we all have pretty, we're all seeing pretty similar features on the eastern part of our maps. But using the amphibious uh, seismic deployment, we really nicely clearly see that there is a line of slow velocities traveling down the volcanic arc separated by a region of somewhat faster velocities, and then a second very distinct uh, region of slow velocities going down the coastline in Cascadia in the four arc region. Um, while we see kind of a lot of the same uh, a long arc or a long strike features in the previous uh, seismic imaging results, we really, because we didn't have the shoreline crossing ray paths, uh, seeing these two distinct slow velocity regions uh, was not very apparent uh, in the previous studies. And so this really is helpful for better understanding kind of the four arc structure in Cascadia. And this was kind of surprising um, that actually uh, we got significantly uh, nicer resolution data in this region from having the offshore instruments. But to return to the overall question of 
um, what is the variability in the source for volcanic arcs? What is the variability in the oceanic lithosphere? So we have these seismic phase velocity images of the Juan de Fuca oceanic uh, lithosphere. And so we can compare them to predictions for you know, simple thermal plate cooling models. Um, and so these three panels are basically showing the difference in our phase velocities that we have observed compared to phase velocities that would be predicted uh, for the Juan de Fuca plate just using the simple conductive cooling models um, to uh, predict the temperature at a given plate age and then using an assumed uh, grain size to translate that into uh, seismic uh, velocity properties and uh, predict seismic phase velocity maps. Um, and so blue colors indicate where um, the, uh, our observed uh, seismic phase velocities are faster than uh, are predicted and red colors indicate where they are slower. Um, and so we see quite a bit of variation and in particular, um, the amount, how fast the velocities get in the center of the plate um, is quite anomalous and quite difficult to explain with just simple thermal plate cooling models. And this has been, th this type of observation has been seen uh, from other authors using the Cascadia data set with uh, uh, body wave tomography studies, um, with also with other surface wave imaging studies, as well as um, attenuation studies. There are various seismic um, properties that are showing that basic thermal plate cooling models don't really look like what um, the uh, oceanic uh, Juan de Fuca lithosphere um, seems to actually look like. Um, and so for example, the slow velocities along the ridge line, our model doesn't have um, any uh, melt in it. So that's probably you know uh, due to the fact that we're not accounting for the uh, effect of melt on the slow velocities. Um, but then also interestingly, uh, when you get into the center portion of the plate uh, and you go along um, these age lines, you know, th there is variability um, and that tr translates into this variability uh, along the strike of the system. Um, for example, at about uh, 45 degrees north, right along the deformation front, you'll see a patch of actually slower than predicted uh, seismic phase velocities, a red patch um, right at the thick black line that indicates the deformation front. And um, this is actually coincident uh, with observations in a previous active source study um, by Shosho Han, uh, Pablo Canales, uh, that have imaged uh, relatively reduced um, seismic velocities in the low cross and upper mantle in that region, as well as increased faulting. And so maybe this is also what we're seeing evidence for in the um, seismic phase velocity, some maybe anomalous uh, hydration or thermal um, anomaly related to uh, that sort of variability. So ultimately, I think you can't, we can't look at these images and look at these images of what the uh, seismic properties are of the oceanic lithosphere, the exposed oceanic lithosphere today and link them to variability in the uh, volcanic arc. There's, um, uh, there's quite, you know, millions of years in between these things of when uh, the oceanic lithosphere that's under the arc um, today uh, was actually um, exposed. And so what I think the importance of this is though, is it does demonstrate that there is heterogeneity and there is variability in the structure of the oceanic lithosphere at these finer scales. When we go and we put uh, a seismic array that um, can image seismic variability at a regional scale, similar to the scales that we have for Earth scope, we actually start to see that same scale of variability. And so local structure in the, sub source, in the subducting plate may be a source of variability for volcanic arc processes, for uh, various uh, earthquake processes, um, and should definitely be considered uh, further in future studies as we start getting more and more images of what the oceanic lithosphere looks like in different areas, um, and hopefully being able to uh, incorporate those into uh, geodynamic models of subduction. So just to quickly wrap up, um, thinking about where some of these things can go and what are some interesting um, future directions. So 
I showed you today um, an example of what the crustal magmatic architecture looks like under two volcanoes in the central Aleutian Island dark. Um, but this really doesn't, this is just two volcanoes. Uh, this um, is not going to uh, be helpful for really characterizing the uh, global tectonic picture of what some of this volcano variability looks like. Um, you know, we want to answer questions like, what does the crustal magmatic architecture look like at other arcs? What are the systematic differences between oceanic and continental arcs? What about a different tectonic setting? We need more data to better constrain the variables regulating volcanic structure. And in fact, there's actually a fair amount of uh, open data available on IRIS. Um, these are the white volcanoes, are volcanoes. Um, that have stations with open data of a similar configuration as to what I've been using at these uh, previous two volcanoes. Um, and so this is encouraging that, you know, this is, provides a uh, nice data set where we could explore this technique um, further uh, and actually maybe get a pretty decent chunk out of a variation of uh, global tectonic settings to investigate. And, uh, in particular, um, I was at the Cove uh, workshop about six or so months ago now, Community Experiments at Volcanoes, and one of the um, ideas that came up there was this idea of, of comparative volcanology, you know, trying to find volcanoes where you can isolate variables um, and to return back to this uh, schematic of this transect in the Aleutians where there is a systematic change in the uh, depths of the slab underneath the volcanoes. This might be a really great transect to go and look at further. And it's already um, the target of uh, some petrologic studies, uh, but you know, to really see if there is um, any sort of gradient uh, change in what the um, uh, crustal magmatic architecture is under these volcanoes? Is it really uh, related to some, is there some relationship to variation in slab depth? Um, or, you know, maybe uh, do we just not have the crust imaged at a high enough resolution uh, as we need to be able to understand the contribution of variability on these volcanoes? Um, and so I think this receiver function technique at volcanoes is useful in the sense that it provides a relatively low investment method of actually getting a baseline construct of what some uh, mid to deeper crustal magmatic architecture is underneath um, volcanoes. It's not gonna get you the nicer high resolution types of images that we're starting to see out of Imush, um, but it could be very useful in terms of planning for a backbone array of instruments um, or to take advantage of uh, monitoring arrays that already exist. And it might also be something uh, that could be used to as a, a um, uh, technique for imaging uh, prior to a future dense deployment at another volcano to better design that array for targeted, um, for, for whatever targets uh, might be of interest for seismic imaging. Okay, so just to summarize, um, as I said, uh, and I hopefully have convinced you of, uh, receiver function techniques are useful for determining this basic mid to deep crustal magmatic architecture, and we only need a few seismic instruments to do it, and typical of a monitoring uh, network at a particular volcano. Um, and also, we, there's evidence, well, we still don't have the final um, uh, constraints on what uh, the uh, magma system underneath Cleveland looks like we're definitely seeing evidence that we can discriminate between different types of magmatic architecture um, and that we see that at Cleveland it really doesn't look like it's a abrupt sill-like structure that we had seen at Akatan. Um, so this can be useful for at least on a broad level characterizing um, a difficult to constrain piece of the volcanic system, the mid to deeper crustal depths, particularly um, if it's not a region of last storage prior to eruption can be uh, difficult to um, constrain with uh, more traditional volcano um, imaging or petrologic techniques. Um, and then lastly, offshore seismic instrumentation really enables us to get a much improved understanding of the oceanic plate by having the same types of resolution um, for regional scale images as you do offshore and onshore. And we do see variability in the subducting plate. And I think um, we're seeing that. We don't 
really have a full understanding of the you know overall connection of that with the subduction system yet um, but we are at least uh, see evidence that it is more complicated than just basic um, thermal plate cooling models and hopefully those are things that we'll be able to continue to incorporate into future models um, so with that I will end and uh, thank you all for sticking out and uh, yeah if anyone has any questions Thank you so much, Helen. That was a very, very clear and well-organized talk. So thank you. We got some feedback already from a couple of folks saying how well attended, like how um, well organized it was and how well put together it was. Um, <laughs> thank you. So, so please um, put in your questions into the questions chat box on your your screen. Um, I have a kickoff question, Helen, if you don't mind. Um, I'm really interested in the work that you did on compliance because of how clear the vertical waveforms now look. Yeah. And I think it's an um, oft overlooked um, noise source from our um, that we obviously see in the vertical component of our of our seismograms. So I'm curious just about the you said it was a MATLAB package that's about to come yeah. out. You know what what it's called, what, you know, what yeah, <laughs> yeah, <out>. yeah, I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I realized as I was giving the talk that I should have put it in here, um, yeah, so it is called Attacker, but it's A-T-A-C-R, um, okay. the motivation was that it attacks the compliance and tilt noise, but <laughs> it's a bit of a nerdy thing, um, but anyway, but, uh, it is available um, on my GitHub, um, and I think I just managed to catalog it with um, the iris size code as well. Um, so yeah, and if you um, basically if you search my name and find my website, there's a link to my GitHub on that if people are interested. So hopefully people uh, hopefully it will be useful for people. Great, great. And um, did you mention that there's like an associated publication coming out? There's the GitHub. Oh. Yeah, so there's the GitHub, and so it's actually tied into um, the publication Yanishevsky et al. 2019, that, that oh. is our uh, phase velocity publication, and there's an okay. appendix in that that explains uh, some of the quality control oh, methods great. that go into okay. that, yeah. And where was that paper published? That's in um, uh, JGI. JGI, okay, great, yeah. perfect. So, okay. Um, that was my one question. Um, <laughs> I, there hasn't been any questions coming. I think your talk was so clear, Helen, that like, I'm <laughs> fine, to be honest. Uh, I think it's such interesting work that you're doing, especially as you're talking about like doing the volcano comparisons in Alaska, yeah. Cleveland versus Akutan. That, that, you know, yeah, those no. are, yeah. Are, 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 yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I think, um, Especially, I mean, the Aleutians, uh, the Aleutians is the um, first place that I did seismic analysis on. Um, and it's, uh, it's a really interesting place. And um, especially, say, compared to some other, the, the oceanic side of the Aleutian Island arc, especially compared to like Izubon and Mariana, um, the crust looks very different. And so uh, I think it's an interesting place when we think about, for example, say the differences between like oceanic arcs and continental arcs, you know, we do know at like this baseline global scale that there are systematic differences um, between an oceanic arc and a continental arc. Um, but for whatever reason, the Aleutians definitely, um, parts of it, the part that is the oceanic um, uh, section uh, really doesn't look like some other oceanic arcs. And so I think that's a interesting place to start thinking about okay well how much is it just the overriding crust driving these things versus the input to the system and um it's also of course a very remote location so maybe you know we'll find out the answer is that we just don't know enough about it to <laughs> um understand some of these things yet and maybe we need to go and do more uh, deployments out there but um yeah i think it's a really interesting place sure john vidali wrote in with a question he asks um is there any 3D modeling of the receiver functions? Because some of the structures look strongly 3D. Yeah, so we haven't um, done that yet. What we're in the process of doing is basically just constructing a very basic forward model um, with uh, estimating the 
um, predicted variation in the S wave arrive the, the S converted wave arrival times um, for putting in different um, velocity structures. So kind of sort of akin to um, almost local tomography, except we're not in a, doing a full blown inversion. Um, basically, kind of using some other geochemical and petrologic um, estimates of what the magma chamber is supposed to look like to see if uh, we can explain our observations with that or if we need some sort of a deeper structure. Um, I think, though, especially at Cleveland, um, it's a compelling place to think about potentially being able to build up um, a more robust type of 3D inversion or something like that, because there are quite a lot of crossing rays. Um, there's a lot of seismicity, and so you could maybe even imagine um, using travel times from uh, both seismicity in the shallow crust related to the volcano, as well as seismicity in the uh, deeper slab as providing other sorts of constraints. Um, it's, yeah, I think that this in particular is um, uh, the geometry of the uh, array um, makes it a compelling place to potentially do that in the future, but that's not what we're uh, working on at the moment. Great. Well, um, okay, let's see, we got another question just came in. Um, Glenn Thompson asks, for receiver function analysis, do you have a recommendation for a code to use, something easy and intuitive? Um, so, yeah, well, <laughs> for, for calculating the receiver functions, I use the iterative um, time domain convolution, uh, deconvolution method for uh, Vigori and Ammon. Um, and I uh, unfortunately just have a lot of codes that I've inherited <laughs> over the years, uh, which is not the ideal situation. Um, I've heard uh, good things about um, uh, Funk Lab, um, uh, but I haven't actually used it. Um, but yeah, I, I wind up often um, just kind of doing my own stuff because also I'm usually not doing, I'm, I'm trying to look at this back as mutual variation and not necessarily doing the standard kind of uh, processing um, techniques people use for just crustal, uh, uh, basic crustal um, uh, constraints. Great, yeah, um, I would have to put another plug for Rob Porritt's um, Funk Lab to um, just that's what we use when we do our iris related training mm -hmm. uh, workshops. So yeah. that that we've seen has been um, the easiest one to use. So I'm glad that you mentioned that, Helen, because yeah. that's exactly what we use for our training. So, yeah. um, okay. Well, thank you for answering all these wonderful questions, especially about codes and different things. But yeah. um, the nitty gritty bits. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for presenting today. And yeah, um, thank you. Let me see. Okay, I did have another question that just came in. Usually this happens, okay. right? I'm wrapping up. Yeah. I get um, Smear um, Atia, sorry if I totally butchered that, but it says, is it possible that some of the variations you see between two volcanoes within the same arc segment, which you attribute to spatial variations, might be caused uh, by differences in the particular stage of magmatic life cycle within each volcanic plumbing system? Yeah, no, I mean, this is the, like, kicker with all seismic imaging uh, targets is that we're seeing the system just at one particular time. Um, and I will say that this, this another um, piece of evidence that ties in why we might expect Cleveland and Akatan to be different is that they, they are very, they do have very different eruptive histories. Um, so Cleveland is an often very active volcano. Um, it's often erupting. Um, Whereas Akatan, I think the last major, um, the last eruption I think was in the early 90s and it had a spout, I think, of geothermal activity or uh, something in uh, 96, but it, it's not, it's a much less active volcano. Um, and how, but that's, you know, again, like the decades scale history of these volcanoes, um, you know, how, how consistent that is over longer periods of time, um, we don't know. And, you know, just in general, um, I think, 
thinking about volcanoes and particularly kind of the deeper crustal part of the system. You know, there, there's a lot of evidence that a lot of eruptions, um, uh, most of the material that comes out is from relatively shallow, but how that affects the deeper part of the system, how stable it is over these longer time scales, um, if there is deep crustal magmatic material storage underneath volcanoes um, that might not be currently active. I, these are a lot of questions we don't know. Um, and yeah, and so, and, and just in general, you know, for understand anything with seismic imaging, especially, you know, tectonically active targets like volcanoes or trying to understand like fault properties for earthquakes uh, related phenomena. Uh, we only have a snapshot um, and we're, we can do the best we can by trying to, you know, get more um, uh, spatial constraints that might, re might represent different um, uh, degrees of activity between different systems, but that, you know, again, ties into this, you know, the spatial variability. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge challenge, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's absolutely a great question. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Helen, for yeah. this presentation and thank you everyone for attending. And um, yeah, so with that, um, I'm going to conclude this webinar and um, thank you everyone who was involved today. So take care and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank, thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>